Right before the founding and establishment of NASA, there was a significant historical event that holds the key to understanding the reason behind their lies and the signing of the UN Treaty on Antarctica. But before looking at this event, it is necessary to examine the theory of the Big Bang. And any historical reference to such a phenomena before the theory was established in 1929 by Edwin Hubble, who was influenced by the work of Albert Einstein and George LeMay. When tracing the beliefs and theories on the origins of the world we inhabit through history, I discovered various creationist tales, primarily of similar nature to the Abrahamic view of creation. I also encountered various works of philosophers and scientists such as Aristotle, Immanuel Kant, Johannes Kepler and Isaac Newton that proposed the theory of the infinite nature of the universe. There is one text, however, that predates all of these ideas. The Kabbalah, a tradition of Jewish mysticism that can be dated back to 13th century BC, a thousand years before Aristotle lived. In traditional understanding, it is said to originate from the time of Eden. The Kabbalah's account of the origin of the earth and universe is a complex one, but the summary of its vision can be understood through its concept of Ein Sof, which translates to unending or infinity. The Kabbalah lays out its origin story as such. In the beginning, the Ein Sof withdrew into itself, creating an empty space or vacuum, within which the forces of Din began to take on an independent life. The contraction of the Ein Sof thus resulted in a purging of the harsh dross, which contained all elements of potential evil from the being of God. The empty space thus contained the forces of Din and a remnant, the Reshemu, or impression of the divine light. At this point, the Ensof emanated a ray which is represented in the first letter of the Tetragrammaton. This ray worked to organize the opposing forces that now filled this space. The opposing forces were together in a vessel no bigger than a tiny spark. This ray caused the shattering of the vessel and formed the planets and brought into manifestation the primordial man. Moses Nachmanites, a 13th century Kabbalist rabbi, summarizes this origin story stating, there was only one physical creation and that creation of a tiny speck. As this speck expanded out, this substance, so thin it has no essence, turned into matter as we know it. This is strikingly similar to what we have come to know as the Big Bang. Universe Today provides a succinct summary of the Big Bang. The Big Bang hypothesis states that all of the current and past matter in the universe came into existence at the same time, roughly 13.8 billion years ago. At this time, all matter was compacted into a very small ball with infinite density and intense heat called a singularity. Suddenly, the singularity began expanding and the universe as we know it began. This is the same story. Both present the idea that in the beginning there was a vacuum and then a small speck appeared and from there began the expansion of matter forming the planets and the world we know today. The only difference is the Kabbalah is written in a mythological discourse and the Big Bang is constructed in scientific discourse. But stylistic language choices aside, it appears that the Kabbalah had worked out the origins of the universe a long time before Einstein, Hubble and others. This leaves us with two conclusions from this discovery. 1. Contemporary Big Bang theory has proven the Kabbalah and its teachings. All people who believe in this theory should seek out the Kabbalist rabbi to learn more about what they believe. Or, two, contemporary Big Bang theory was stolen from the Kabbalah, in which case neither is correct and it is all a big lie. I will return to this origin story shortly, but before I do, it is essential that we look at some of the esoteric teachings of the Kabbalah. Kabbalah in Hebrew means to receive or to orally receive. The secret, esoteric teachings of its mysticism were orally taught, written in codes, numerologies and symbols. Symbolism and numerology are especially important in Kabbalistic mysticism. 
Many books of the Kabbalah are extremely cryptic in nature, especially the book of Zohar, which translates as splendor, and the book of Bahir, which translates as illumination. Both texts have been deemed to be coded with gematria, which is a form of numerology where letters have corresponding numbers. A well-known example of Hebrew gematria is the word chai, which translates to alive, and is composed of two Hebrew letters that add up to the number 18. This has made the number 18 a lucky number for Jewish people, and gifts of money in multiples of 18 are very popular. Symbols are equally important in the Kabbalah, and have been used as a method of conveying meaning, and their secret teaching since its inception. Some of these symbols are widely recognized. For instance, the Kabbalah Tree of Life or the Sephirot, the Hamza, and perhaps most famously, the six-pointed star, the hexagram, or what is now referred to as the Star of David, and the symbol adorning Israel's flag. It is found in early texts of the Kabbalah, and its earliest Jewish association dates back to the Leningrad Codex of 1008. It is this six-pointed star that I would like to focus on now. For you see, it was not always a symbol of Israel, nor is it exclusive to Judaism. To understand the hidden history of this symbol, we must first journey to the year 1760, as Mayor Amschel Bauer returns to Frankfurt to take over his deceased father's business in money lending. Before his death, and in his son's absence, Mayer's father had mounted a coat of arms on the front of the entrance to the counting house to honour its name. The sign features a hexagram against a red shield. It was because of this sign that Bauer changed his surname. Rot is German for red and Schild is German for sign. So he took the name and became known as Mayer Amschel Rothschild. As Mayer's business began to thrive due to his discovery of loaning money to governments rather than individuals, he enlisted Adam Weishaupt to create the Order of the Illuminati, which was completed and established on May 1st of 1776. Soon after, Weishaupt merged the secret doctrines of the Illuminati with the Continental Order of Freemasons, which was founded in 1717 and largely peaceful until this merge. He then went on to establish the famous Freemason lodges of the Grand Orient to be the Illuminati headquarters. In establishing this order, Weishaupt recruited 2,000 followers, including the most intellectual men in the arts, education, science, finance and industry. They were given the following instructions in order to gain control. Number 1. Use money and sex bribes to obtain control of men in high positions. Number 2. Colleges and universities were to cultivate students possessing exceptional abilities and train them specifically in internationalism. Number three, all influential people were to be used as agents and placed behind the scenes of all governments as experts and specialists. Number four, to obtain absolute control of the press. The drive for control and power soon began. Sending literature to Paris to provoke the stirrings of the French Revolution Adam Weishaupt's courier was struck by lightning, revealing the texts contained inside which outline plans to provoke such a revolution. The Bavarian authorities seized the text and the government published the details of their doctrines in a text titled The Original Writings of the Order and Sect of the Illuminati. Unfortunately, Europe did not heed their warning and the French Revolution took place which made the Rothschilds a lot of money due to the laws that limited Roman church taxes. In 1798, John Robinson, one of the leading intellectuals of his time and professor at Edinburgh University, published a book, Proofs of a Conspiracy Against Religions and Governments of Europe, carried on in the secret meetings of Freemasons, Illuminati and secret societies. Again, no one heeded Robinson's warning. In 1812, Mayor Rothschild died and laid out specific laws for the House of Rothschild, which are 1. Only males will enter the business 2. Intermarry to preserve fortune and 3. The eldest son of the eldest son is to become the head of the family. After his death, Mayer's children left Frankfurt and established banks in all major European cities. Nathan Rothschild moved to London at 21 where he established a banking house. 
During the Napoleonic Wars, the five Rothschild brothers worked to provide gold to both Wellington's army through Nathan in England and Napoleon's army through Jacob in France, thus establishing a formula they would retain until the present day. Exactly this, fund both sides of each war and become rich in the process and aftermath. The Napoleonic War forced Britain and many other countries in Europe to borrow vast sums from the Rothschild Bank with interest rates they would never ever be able to pay back. Furthermore, they manipulated the stock market. During the war, speculators would watch the value of Nathan Rothschild's British war bonds in an attempt to guess who would win the war. Shortly after the battle ended and long before anyone else knew who was the victor, Rothschild began selling bonds. Everyone assumed this meant that Napoleon had won and Europe had lost. Panic selling followed and when prices crashed, Nathan bought the majority of these bonds. The ownership of such high value bonds meant that the Rothschilds literally owned the Bank of England. From that moment onwards, the interests of the British Crown and the Rothschilds became so entwined that the Rothschilds were given titles of nobility. Nathan famously said, I care not what puppet is placed upon the throne of England to rule the empire on which the sun never sets. The man who controls Britain's money supply controls the British empire and I control the British money supply. The Rothschilds used their control of the Bank of England to replace the method of shipping gold from country to country and instead used their European banking network to establish a system of paper debits and credits, the same system we use today. At the end of this period, the Rothschild family controlled half the wealth of the entire world. During the 19th century, the Rothschilds took control over the financial operations of the Catholic Church worldwide and began setting up their banks in the United States. They also began to gain control in other areas of industry. In 1862, the Rothschilds used one of their own, John D. Rockefeller, to form an oil company called Standard Oil, which went on to dominate all competition and was funded to prominence by the Rothschilds. The Rockefellers would go on to lead oil, establish Big Pharma, and own all the major education systems, colleges in the United States. The Rothschilds' power and influence grew through the tentacles of each industry as planned with the establishment of the Illuminati. Towards the end of the 19th century, and before establishing their major dominant banking presence in the United States, the Rothschilds founded the Zionist Congress to promote Zionism a political movement with the sole aim of moving all Jews into a singular Jewish nation state and arranged its first meeting in Munich. The meeting was chaired by Theodor Herzl who later stated in his diary, it is essential that the sufferings of Jews become worse. This will assist in realization of our plans. I have an excellent idea. I shall induce anti-Semites to liquidate Jewish wealth. The anti-Semites will assist us thereby in that they will strengthen the persecution and oppression of Jews. The anti-Semites shall be our best friends. The youngest son of Jacob Rothschild also visited Palestine during this time and supplied funding to establish the first Jewish colonies there. The Rothschild plan to establish Israel and its own Rothschild owned country was underway but it would not be until many years later that that plan came to fruition. Notice the hexagram on the flags at the Zionist Congress. In 1910, plans were underway in the United States to set up the Rothschild centrally owned bank, the Federal Reserve. The plans for a United States central bank were met with strong opposition from some of the wealthiest figures of the time. The three most important and powerful opponents were Benjamin Guggenheim, Isidore Strauss, the head of Macy's department stores, and John Jacob Astor, one of the wealthiest men in the world and good friend of genius inventor Nikola Tesla. Their total wealth at that time was $500 million. By today's standards, that would amount to nearly $11 billion. The opposition did not last long, however. Conveniently for the Rothschilds, all three powerful opponents died aboard the Titanic when it sunk in 1912. 
Coincidentally, it was the Illuminati puppet JP Morgan who funded and built the Titanic and who was also extremely keen to establish the Federal Reserve. He cancelled his ticket on the Titanic at the last minute. Congressman Charles Lindbergh said the following after the Federal Reserve Act was passed in 1913. The last part of this statement is especially important. From now on, depressions will be scientifically created. Like two con men working a mark, the Fed made credit easy while establishment newspapers hyped what riches could be made in the stock market. Federal Reserve meant that the dollar could now be printed outside of the government's control. It would be used to drive economic war and depressions and was the perfect machine for eternal debt. Abraham Lincoln fought against the establishment of this method and began printing his own debt-free money, what was termed greenbacks during the American Civil War. Similarly, JFK signed an executive order which returned the US government the power to issue currency, bypassing the Rothschild's own Federal Reserve. What do both of these presidents have in common? They wanted to print dollars for the American people against the wishes of the Rothschild system and both were assassinated. During World War I, we see the same Rothschild war formula play out. The German Rothschild loaned money to the German government. The British Rothschild loaned money to the British government. And the French Rothschild loaned money to the French government. During the war, and while Britain is considering Germany's offer of armistice, Louis Brandet, the elected leader of the Executive Committee for Zionist Affairs, sends a Zionist delegate from America to Britain, with the promise to bring America on the side of the British, provided the British agree to give the land of Palestine to the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds had interest in the Far East, and having their own governed state meant that they could own their own military, which they could use on any aggressor who stood in the way of those interests. In light of this, the British Foreign Secretary, Arthur James Balfour, drafted a letter which became known as the Balfour Declaration to none other than dear Lord Rothschild. It states that the British government would do all it can to help establish Palestine a national home for the Jewish people. In 1919, the Paris Peace Conference was held to discuss reparations that the Germans needed to pay to the victors of the war. The host of the conference was Baron Edmund de Rothschild. A delegation of 117 Zionists headed up by Bernard Barak brought up the subject of Palestine. The Germans felt betrayed as the nation had always had good relations towards Jews. The conference was also used by the Rothschilds to float the idea of setting up a world government called the League of Nations. Bernard Barak then went on to found the Council on Foreign Relations in the US. The first objective of the Council on Foreign Relations was to gain control of the press. This task was given to none other than John D. Rockefeller, who set up many national magazines such as Life and Time magazine. With the Rothschild's power presence now firmly established in the US, they soon began preparations for World War II. At the same time, Adolf Hitler, the Chancellor of Germany, was driving Jews out of governmental positions. A Rothschild puppet, Samuel Untermeyer, the head of American delegation and blackmailer of President Roosevelt, called for all Americans to destroy German-made products and thus began a large propaganda campaign. Once the effects of this boycott began to be felt in Germany, the Germans, who had demonstrated no violence towards the Jews up to this point, simply began boycotting Jewish stores in the same way the Jews had done to stores selling German products in America. This is the same year that President Roosevelt ordered the Illuminati Eye to be placed upon all new dollar bills, along with the Latin phrase Novus Ordo Seclorum, which means a new order of the ages. 
One year later, Swiss banking secrecy laws were reformed and it became an imprisonable offence for any bank employee to violate bank secrecy. This is all in preparation to cover the trace of the Rothschilds as they fund both sides of the war. You see, the Rothschild controlled US company IG Farben would go on to arm Germany in the war and produce Zyklon B, the lethal gas used in the concentration camps. The Rothschilds also financed American IBM, which provided the supply machines to the Nazis to produce the punch cards to help organize and manage initial identification and expulsion of Jews, the confiscation of their property and their eventual extermination. Interestingly, during this time, Prescott Bush, the father of President George Herbert Walker Bush, had his company seized under the Trade-In with the Enemy Act. He was funding Hitler from America while American soldiers were fighting against the Germans. The Rothschild's connection to Hitler may be more understated than initially realized. As Hans-Jürgen Kohler's Inside the Gestapo states, Adolf Hitler's grandmother Maria was a servant at the Rothschild mansion. You see, the war was very choreographed and had nothing but the Rothschild's interests in mind. As Zionist Isaac Greenbaum in a speech to the Zionist Executive Council put so succinctly, one cow in Palestine is worth more than all the Jews in Poland. This piece of propaganda was to scare Jewish survivors into believing their only place of safety was Israel. At the end of the war, in 1945, the Rothschilds not only profited significantly financially, but their vision of a League of Nations came to fruition with the establishment of the United Nations. British had stated that there would be no more immigration of Jews to Palestine in order to protect the Palestinians, but after the Second World War, the British transferred control of Palestine to the United Nations. The United Nations divided Palestine into two states, one Zionist and one Arab, with Jerusalem to remain as an international zone to be shared by all religious faiths. In the years that followed, the Israelis launched a series of military assaults on the Arab Palestinians, causing a mass exodus. The Israeli secret intelligence agency, the Mossad, was formed. Its motto is, by way of deception, thou shalt do war. In 1948, the Rothschild bribed President Harry S. Truman with $2 million, which they gave him on his campaign trail, to recognize Israel as a sovereign state. The flag of Israel was soon revealed, which is none other than a blue version of the Rothschild red hexagram. And this is where the story just begins. Follow me to part six, so we can take a look at the true meaning of this six-sided star.